Paul Chamberlain. Um, again, those of you who have worked in Cox's Bazaar um, will know him very well. Uh, he is an emergency preparedness and response specialist for MOAS, which is the Migrant Offshore uh, Aid Station, uh, a UK-based uh, agency. Uh, and he'll be giving a presentation on fire response in refugee settlements in Cox's Bazaar, uh, a case study. Um, so, Paul, maybe if you can turn on your camera and see if you're able to share your presentation. Unmute yourself, maybe. I did warn you, Bruce, that technology and I uh, we have a don't, don't get on. So, hang on, let me let me try and bring this up. So. I don't know how much you can or can't see. Can you see it? Nothing yet. Let's give it a second. Okay, hang on. It's just, I think I have to click share screen, don't I? On this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oops. Make sure you uh, click um, share sound as well. Okay. Oh, it's asking me lots of complicated things. So there is no sound to share. Okay, great. Um, but hopefully if I do that. Are we there now? Yeah, put it in full screen. Yeah, there we go. Very good. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so um, I'll start by saying good afternoon, good morning, um, good day, wherever you are. Um, and uh, thank you for that that introduction, Bruce. It's um it's a bit of an honour to be presenting to people today on 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 this subject. And it's those of you that do know me, it's a subject that I do tend to kind of bang on about with with passion. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start by saying that um, I'm I'm not a traditional humanitarian, um, whatever a traditional humanitarian is. My, my background is primarily technical rescue, maritime search and rescue and specialist firefighting, which I've been involved in for around 20 years. So, so I, I bring quite a different viewpoint to EPR and, and, and quite a different um, set of skills to, to emergency response. So, so I wanna start by talking a little bit about the, the generics of where the work that I've been doing fits in, and then look at how that fits specifically into fire response that, that, that we've developed here in Cox's Bazaar. Now, I, I fully appreciate that some of the points that I'm going to talk about are not relevant in certain geographies and certain contexts, but I think there's a lot of generalist points um, and concepts that, that as a cluster we should um, maybe embrace and we should maybe take forward. So essentially, the, the, you know, the, this should be nothing new to people and uh, the, the presentation from colleagues on disaster response in Indonesia um, showed a similar kind of model to this in terms of the emergency response cycle. And typically a, a disaster happens, we respond to that disaster, we then recover, we try to get better, we plan for it to happen again, and we sit around and wait for it to happen again. And, and this, this cyclical system kind of moves forward. Now, my kind of, my world and, and the response that I've done has been very, very much frontline response. So I, I've been fortunate enough to work with the Coast Guard in the UK and, and fly on helicopters where your response time is measured in minutes. Um, I, I've worked as a professional firefighter, again, where your response time is measured in minutes. So, you know, typically, though, this is somewhat different from a humanitarian response, because the, the two components, while, while they need to merge, the two components are, are quite different. And primarily what I'm going to be focusing on is if you look at the uh, the diagram on the right, the upper end of that model. So, so it's the, the incidents that happen relatively infrequently, but cause the most amount of damage. 
so the intensive risk. So we're talking about major earthquakes, cyclonic events, major flooding, uh, and, and fires, similar to those that we've experienced in Cox's Bazaar. So if we, if we look at this, this slide on the left-hand side, the disaster strikes, and in the event of a fire, we have a period while the fire is burning. And typically that is where my intervention um, is. The humanitarian response to that fire generally starts once the fire has been extinguished. And at that point, we have a slightly different response. So, so my work essentially has focused on reducing this disaster gap. How can we bring the humanitarian response closer to the time of disaster? How can we reduce this disaster gap? And ultimately, if we can reduce this disaster gap, we can return to normal life for, for the refugees or the people living in an IDP um, quicker. We can also um, save funds because we can, if, if we're smart about it, we can make the effects of the, the incident less damaging. If we can fight, respond to fires faster, we can, they will not burn as many shelters. If we can respond to flooding faster and we can evacuate people quicker and better, we can, we can reduce the effect on their lives. So, so that's kind of the, been the focus of my work here in Cox Bazaar for the last five years. Primarily, it started off through flooding and flood response, um, working with um, site management agencies and site management partners and developing a capacity to keep frontline refugee responders safe during times of flood. Um, that kind of expanded and we've, we've since done some work with um, UN agencies and NGOs to, to actually keep their staff safe in times of flood. Because if we can mobilize humanitarians into the, uh, into the flooded area quicker and they have some basic skills to allow them to access that flooded area quicker, ultimately the assessments can start sooner and the response can happen quicker. So it's about squeezing that disaster gap and getting the right help to the right people as quickly as possible. Oops. So, you know, th th these two pictures kind of show that timeline in effect. And this was a fire that we responded to on the 9th of March last year in, um, in the Kutupalon camp. And it happened at about three o'clock in the afternoon. And the picture on the left shows essentially what we saw as we were driving to the fire incident. Um, and the picture on the right was taken the following day after that fire had destroyed around 600 shelters, um, a number of health facilities, including uh, a primary health clinic. So, you know, the quicker we can mobilize these fires, the quicker we can put them out, the quicker we can. Um, we can get back to normal. So the skills that, that we in effect bring, we can break them down into three areas and we focus very much on, on three areas. So in terms of firefighting and in terms of flood response, um, there, there are three components. The first is building the first response capacity. And the key first responders tend to be the residents because they are that, that number one, they have a vested interest in um, safeguarding their own communities. Number two, they are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they are the best level of first responders. So we want to focus on trying to build some capacity within that cohort. The second thing we want to do is build humanitarian capacity. And that's primarily around giving uh, camp managers camp coordinators, program managers, um, the right skill set to provide the responders with the right information to actually, you know, manage the incident as a, as a firefighter would manage the incident uh, and think about that phase as well as the humanitarian response. And the third thing that we do as an organization is we provide specialist support. So we can provide 
on the ground staff to uh, come in and help develop this capacity. So in terms of capacity building, there's, there's essentially um, two things, two focuses that we've had. Um, the first, as you can see on the left, is firefighting. Um, and the one on the right is uh, based around flood and water rescue. And these are, it's important to say, these are primarily volunteers that are running these operations. Within the Cox's Bazaar camps uh, of a million people, we've developed a fire service to, in its simplest terms. There are now 55 um, three-wheeler tuk-tuk firefighting vehicles. There are around 900 lightweight portable pumps and 1,500 um, tanks uh, with a dedicated, 1,000 litre tanks with a dedicated supply of water to fight fires. The, um, the, the picture on the right, again, is shows the development of flood rescue skills to keep responders safe. And this is um, with the government of Bangladesh and the Cyclone Preparedness Programme. We work very close with, like I said, with, with humanitarian partners to build capacity, um, whether that's UNHCR, whether that's IOM, whether that's state actors such as the fire service, who we also provide training to. Um, and the picture on the left is some training we delivered to um, Bangladesh Fire Service um, around incident command and development of INSARAG capabilities within the country. The, the picture on the right was a, a lessons learned workshop that we ran um, after a, a relatively small fire, but we also provide um, other workshops to humanitarians around flood and, and, and fire. And the third thing is um, specialist support. So we, we can put people onto the ground and you know these are people with the skill set and the knowledge and the experience to actually develop these skills within the camps. So what does all that kind of look like? Um, about a month ago, we had a major fire in one of the camps in Kutukolong. And I, I received a um, WhatsApp picture. Uh, I was in my office at the time, which is about an hour away from the camps. I received a WhatsApp picture and um, that was enough for me to mobilize to the camps with my teams. Um, and I've got, I've got about 15 staff here who primarily support the refugees in terms of training, but also will respond in the event of a fire. We struggled initially to ascertain exactly where the fire was, which I know sounds quite strange, but when you have a big plume of smoke and a large undulating area, it's very difficult to pin an exact location. What we can ascertain with the, the knowledge and the skills we have is we, we are quite good at predicting fire behavior. So we do a lot of work with the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa and the University of Maryland in the States, and we can actually predict fire behavior within refugee camps. So we understand where it is safe to actually send um, volunteer responders to, how we can safely fight these fires. Because these fires, as I'm sure you've all seen from pictures, they, they develop very big, very quickly. They, part of the research that we did in Kutupalong was we took the shelter sector standard shelter design and we turned the fuel that is in that shelter into a calorific value. And we thought, well, that's just a number that doesn't mean much. So we, we, we want to make that a visual thing. So we then turned that calorific value into litres of diesel. And we, we came to the number that it was roughly one shelter without the contents of the shelter. So just the shelter material is the same as 40, 40 litres of diesel. So we shouldn't be surprised that, that these fires grow very big very quickly. We also shouldn't be surprised that the current um, you know, best fit globally, which, which we think we have the solution to, which is buckets of sand and five kilo domestic fire extinguishers, 
don't actually work. So, so, so what, once we kind of, once we came up with a solution, which was primarily water is the, you know, the key firefighting medium in all of this, we, we then went, right, let's install a system, which we did. So this fire on the 11th, uh, sorry, on the, the 5th or 6th of March this year, it, it kind of began in the kind of top left-hand corner almost of the burnt area. And the prevailing wind was towards the bottom right-hand corner. Um, we had a number of opportunities to, to break the fire. And we also had uh, a number of places where we knew it wouldn't expand to. So, so in the event, the, the fire will always look for fuel. So as you can see on the kind of top right, there, there's a, um, a canal system, a river. So we knew the fire was relatively safe there. Um, and then there's some paddy fields. So we knew the fire was not going to encroach too much there. In terms of mobilizing volunteer responders, the last thing we want to do is to put them at risk. So the last thing we do is put them into the, what we call the head of the fire, which is where the wind is actually blowing the fire to. So that, that in effect is the straight line on the bottom right of the picture as you can see it. So we, we made sure that we could mobilize um, responders, volunteer community responders to the north and also to the, the west and the southwest, um, where the fire was kind of spreading laterally. And it spreads laterally without the force of the wind behind it. Um, I had a number of fire teams also in the north and kind of to the west, and they were supporting the volunteer team. And I think at the height of it, we had something like 15 of the three wheel tuk tuks and a number of other powered pumps as well. Key to this, this fire, though, was that almost straight line in the south. Uh, east. Uh, that's, a, that's a main road for those of you that know it with a market on both sides. And what we couldn't afford to do is to let the fire jump that, that main road. So strategically, we had to hold the fire at that main road. Um, operationally, that is the most dangerous place to commit fire and rescue personnel to. And what happened more through luck than, than good planning was I met up with the deputy director of the fire service, the Cox's Bazaar, um, and, and he went to the south of that area with some teams. I stayed on the north of the main road with some teams and between as we fought towards that fire. So it's a, it's a team effort that engages not only information from site management and CCCM partners, but also from state actors. And the, the humanitarian community are, are, are vital to providing accurate information to supporting responders and recognizing the risk in camps. So we know that there is a risk in IDP camps. And, and I know later on um, this afternoon, this evening, Danielle from Kindling is gonna probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, what we have done in Cox's Bazaar is, I believe, globally unique. We've developed a fire response system within a city of a million people where there wasn't one originally. Um, we recognize the unique uh, intricacies of operating within a, a refugee settlement, the limited access, and we've overcome those solutions with locally made um, pumping system. One of the key things for us in the manufacture of the equipment was we wanted to make sure everything was available locally in Bangladesh and could be re repaired locally within Bangladesh as well. So we, we didn't want to bring in um, expensive you know, European or American firefighting equipment if we couldn't get spare parts to repair them. So, so that was kind of fundamental to the whole operation and the whole system. We've had a number of successes um, of the system. The system went fully live on the 13th of March, I think. So about a week 
after this fire. And when I say fully live, I mean every one of the 30 camp or 33 camps that we have here, every one of the 3,200 volunteers um, has received the training. Every camp has water supply. Every camp has, has power pumps. Um, during the, the fire event on the 6th of March, we um, UNHCR co-responded alongside IOM. Um, and, and the one thing we also have to recognize is that while we have these lines on a map to, to represent different areas of responsibility, the fire doesn't recognize any of these. The fire will just spread. My, my message is essentially a, a, a simple one. Move this forward, but it doesn't seem to want to go. So my, my message is a, is, is, a, is a fairly simple one, and, and this is what it looks like in practice. We need to build capacity to fight fires. Catherine previously spoke about climate change and global warming. We know that um, as, as the environment warms up, the risk of fires potentially increases. We need to ensure that we can provide to our staff who we have a duty of care to look after. We need to provide them with knowledge and skills through the workshops or online learning. We need to differentiate between skills and knowledge outcomes. Um, firefighting is a skill. Resp um, responding to fires, responding to flooding, tactically planning where you're going to send responders to is a skill. It, it cannot be learned from PowerPoints. So we have to practice and we have to practice for the actual event. Um, the, the picture on this slide is just one of a number of um, training sessions that we've delivered over the last two years. And contrary to, to what is typically delivered, which might be a, a small fire that's put out by a fire extinguisher, we, we recognize very quickly that that's not the reality of fires within these settlements. So we tried to make the training as realistic, but also as safe as possible. Um, so, so we supervise the students very closely. And at the end of their two day training course, they, they were all confronted with a fire similar to the one you can see in that picture as, as the culmination of the course. It's, it's hugely important we, we train for the actual event and not train as a tick box exercise. Because the reality of it is a, a major fire is a, is a dark, um, incredibly uncomfortably hot, um, smoky, noisy place to be. And, and we want to replicate that as best as we can during the, the, the training that we deliver. We also want to try and, like I alluded to right at the start, reduce the effect of the disaster by speeding up humanitarian access. So the quicker we can respond to fires, the more effect effectively we can respond to fires the quicker we can make it, we, we can provide humanitarian access, the quicker we can start to rebuild the lives of the people that, that, that have suffered as a result of the fire. And that for me is, is the main driver in, in the work that we've been doing. Um, there's also cost saving benefits, um, which you know, we, we all recognize globally at the moment, there are, there are different pressures on budgets. So, if we can demonstrate to donors that, that, that we are making the best use of their funds, that, then I think that's a, that, that's a spin off. But ultimately, for me, it's about bringing life back to normal as quickly as we can. A fire is a terrifying place to be, it's a terrifying thing to flee from. And um, unless, you, uh, unless you understand it, it can seem very unpredictable um, and, and, and confusing. So, so we want to try and demystify some of that confusion and some of that worry and some of that fear. The, the latest piece of work that we've just been, we just started about 10 days ago. And again, it's, I, I posted a, uh, a picture on LinkedIn and a small video on my LinkedIn profile, um, is we've just started looking at the um, effect of cooking within refugee shelters. And, if you leave a pan of oil on a gas stove or a wood fire for too long, 
the oil ignites and the risk of using either a fire extinguisher or a water-based firefighting medium on that pot of water. Um, and I was actually out in the camp demonstrating this to um, UN agencies this morning, um, and we managed to engulf uh, an entire shelter as a result using about 100 milliliters of water. Um, we've actually done some uh, polls of uh, and focus groups of refugees in the camp and asked them, you know, how would you put out a small cooking fire? We've, we've done demonstrations with them, and, and it's roughly split about 30% would use a fire extinguisher, 30% would use a wet cloth, and 30% would use water. In that situation, there is only one correct answer, and it's use a wet cloth. So the focus groups that we've conducted here would indicate that 60% of people would potentially make that fire worse. Um, and, and as you can imagine, uh, a burning pan of hot oil in a shelter made out of tarpaulin or in a tent um, is not just going to damage the, the tent that it starts in, but probably three or four next door to it. Um, the, the final picture before I kind of go, and I'm, I, you know, if people want to post anything in the chat, I'm quite happy to try and answer two or three questions um, around the work that we've done, because I appreciate this has probably thrown up more questions than it might have given people answers to. Um, so the final component, if you like, in the work is um, the, the piece of equipment you can see this volunteer using. And the, the, the main aim of the system is to uh, provide a lot of water very, very quickly to put the fire out. So we use uh, slightly modified irrigation pumps that can deliver 250 liters of water per minute. That's the equivalent of 50 fire extinguishers in one minute. And the water is used to take the heat out of the fire and, and to allow for a mop-up operation. And essentially what you can see here is part of the mop-up operation, which is a, a volunteer using a wildfire backpack. Because the, the key component to the research that we've done with Stellenbosch and with Maryland in terms of fire behavior is the recognition that these fires, once they develop, they develop into a wildfire and they behave in the same way like a wildfire would do in California or in South Africa or in Australia or anywhere else in the world. Um, so they are wind driven, they are governed by temperature, they are governed by humidity, they are governed by topography, um, and they are governed by availability of fuels. So you know, th this, this kind of process of mopping up is the final extinguishing of the fire once, once the heat has been removed and the vast majority of the risk has been removed as well. Um, I think I'm just about done. Like I said, I'm, I'm quite happy to answer um, any questions if, if you're okay with that, Bruce, if people want to put anything in the chat. Um, but you know, I'd like to just thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me as well directly if you've got any um, any questions or any points that, that you'd like to raise. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, that was a very powerful uh, presentation. Uh, and um, from a perspective, that was very close to the ground level uh, in Cox's Bazaar. So I think we we all appreciate that. And I think just from my uh, personal experience, working in, in, in several sort of CCM uh, contexts that, um, you know, fire fire response, I think is is a fairly underfunded uh, and under equipped and reasonably, I guess, under thought of uh, risk um, that we all face that is that has a joint accountability um, of all sort of humanitarian actors. Uh, considering that we have a very CCCM heavy audience online at the moment, I'd just like to ask you, um, from your experience working in one of the, I guess, largest displacement camps in the world, in Cox's Bazaar, with sort of very huge, like very large scale um, CCCM or site management support, as it's known there, uh, teams on the ground, could you maybe highlight some of the good practice, let's say, from CCCM teams that you think um, people on this call might like to hear from that could be re replicable 
um, in uh, in other contexts, I guess, in terms of the role of of site management and CC. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I, I alluded to it in the presentation that um, the fire doesn't recognize boundaries uh, and doesn't recognize the lines we draw on the map. And there have been some phenomenal um, fire responses where interagency and inter NGO cooperation has actually come to the fore and record and, and where you have one agency that recognizes that they have a resource that might be relevant to the to the incident to the fire and, and making that resource available. And I think it's it's recognizing that while you have a fire that right now might not directly affect you, it may do if we can't attack it quickly. So so recognizing the value of the resources that you have and making those resources available to the common good. And, that, and in terms of that, that, that cooperation, we've seen some phenomenal um, responses to that. We've also seen some really, um, you know, really powerful responses from the fire teams we have trained in the camp where the, uh, the, the camp management partner has empowered them to respond to fires beyond the camp boundary. And, you know, given the, given the potential delay in state actors arriving to a, to a location in the Cox Bazaar district, whether that's the, or the Technaf district, you know, the, the ability of these, these mini fire teams now to respond to a fire just outside the camp boundary and extinguish that fire so it so, so it does two things number one it doesn't spread to the camp and number two it it actually integrates the refugees into the host community because they're providing a really valuable service so you know so that the, the, the cccm partners that we've worked with here they they've taken it upon themselves to empower the volunteers so once you have that resource don't be afraid to kind of let it go i guess is what i'm saying you know it's it's not a resource to control tightly it's a resource to let let happen and um and certainly there's there's some phenomenal examples of that here um i've, I've been into mini fire stations in the camps where they they keep the tuk-tuks which are as well presented as some fire stations i've been to in developing countries so you know so so everybody should be commended for that and like i said you get a real the, the refugees have this real sense of pride that they're providing something for not only their community but the host communities that have welcomed them in as well in in terms of like you said the kind of spend i think it's you know, the, the, the key message is don't underestimate fire um and we know it's it's maybe a it's an area that's not like you said, it's not focused on in terms of funding. It doesn't receive huge amounts of funding, but it's about recognizing what, what that fire is, recognizing that within the environment where you are working, whether that's a tented camp, whether that's a camp like it is here made out of bamboo, or whether that's um, a camp with more permanent structures, trying to understand the fire risk and actually making sure you have appropriate firefighting modalities for that risk because this is not a one-size-fits-all i can you know I, i've got a lot of experience of the refugee context here i understand how fires develop in tented camps as well but there are slight nuances so it's the, the first thing that the that i think practitioners need to do is spend time understanding the fire risk and then plan to mitigate that fire risk Thanks. Thanks a lot for that comprehensive answer, Paul. Um, I, I certainly think that the uh, the community-based uh, disaster response mechanisms um, in Cox's Bazaar are, are one of the the successes of that response. Certainly, linking linking the first line responders in the community to the um, to the more I guess um, institutional uh, fire response um, actors uh, actors there. And I, I, like you say, once you've invested in them to respond to fires in the camp, why would you not utilize that capacity? Yeah. And, um, and I and, and I think what's also important is we've we, we've engaged with Bangladesh Fire Service and Civil Defence, and you know I I kind of speak their language, so I can I can walk into the as senior officers 
room and I, I can walk in as a, a fire professional and he will engage with me as a fire professional and that's that's maybe slightly different to how he would engage with me if if I had a slightly different background so so we can leverage that here certainly um, and but but key to the whole system and key to getting the system up and running is is integrating within the state response as well you know this is this is not something that we've set up kind of as an independent competitive fire service like in the Victorian days of London where you had a you had a plaque on your house wall and you'd only squirt water on the house that had your plaque on we, we've integrated these volunteers within the state response as well and they all recognize that as soon as the fire service arrive they they in effect become volunteers of the fire service they they relinquish control at that point to the senior fire officer on scene um, and, and that's been a key part of the training and a key part of the the whole program to get that integrated response um, from not only state actors but also um, the refugee community great thanks a lot paul um for the for the very interesting presentation um and certainly a conversation that i think we're we're going to be continuing um with the global ccm cluster but then also another presentation uh today at uh, 4 p.m uh by kindling safety um on the state of fire safety in humanitarian settings which i'm sure will be very complementary to what you presented today um feel free to stick around um you know if you want to drop some links in the chat to some of the work or case studies that you've highlighted um in your presentation um please please go ahead um and thank you very much for brian for letting us take 10 minutes of your time to to continue the conversation on on fire response paul thank you very much thanks a lot bruce appreciate it